In 1997, Art Bell, host of the Coast to Coast AM radio show, received a fax from a man named Mel Waters. The fax detailed a mysterious phenomenon, an apparently bottomless pit on Mel's property near Manus in Washington. Art subsequently featured Mel on his radio show, where Mel shared the story of what would later be known as Mel's Hole with the World. For decades, the story of Mel's Hole had mystified everyone. But what is the reality of Mel's Hole? Was it a secret military project or a portal to another universe? Do aliens visit our planet through this bottomless hole? Keep watching to find out. During the interview, Mel was located in Ellensburg, Washington, not at his property. Mel had acquired the land a few years earlier, and the previous owners had held it for over three decades. The neighbors were familiar with the hole, and they often used it as a dumping ground for their refuse, yet it never seemed to fill. The hole was encircled by a stone retaining wall and descended about 15 feet below the ground surface. Beyond the wall, it penetrated through dirt and bedrock, leading into an abyss of impenetrable darkness. Curiously, no one could recall a time when the hole did not exist. Reasonably, there was no indication that the pit had a discernible bottom. Objects dropped into the hole produced no sound, no splash, no crash, and no noise echoed back from the top. The oddities surrounding Mel's hole extended beyond its depth. Animals, especially Mel's dogs, exhibited an aversion to the pit. Despite their loyalty, the dogs would never approach it. If Mel tried to guide the dog toward the hole with a leash, the dog resisted and dug its paws into the ground. This phenomenon wasn't exclusive to Mel's dogs. No pets belonging to him or others dared to go near this mysterious pit. Mel recounted a neighbor's story where a hunter disposed of a deceased dog into the hole. Strangely, the hunter later claimed to have seen the same dog, wearing the same collar, running through the woods as if it were chasing game. Driven by curiosity, Mel decided to try a series of experiments to uncover the mysteries of this mysterious pit on his property. Drawing on his experience as a former shark fisherman, Mel devised a plan to ascertain the presence of water in the pit. He tied the end of his fishing line through a roll of Lifesaver's candy and lowered it into the pit. The candy, intended to dissolve in the theoretical water, hung at 1,500 feet for a sufficient duration before Mel retrieved the line. Surprisingly, the candy remained intact, which indicated an absence of water at that depth. Mel was mystified, but he proceeded to the next experiment and chose a more direct approach. He lowered a one-pound lead weight down the pit, and while the line reached its limit, he attached a new spool of fishing line and continued the descent. Spool after spool, Mel persisted in this method, eventually utilizing an astounding 80,000 feet of fishing line, equivalent to over 15 miles. While Art's radio audience found the story intriguing, they had doubts. Callers offered diverse ideas for further experiments, exploring possibilities and challenging the initial findings. Some suggested the possibility that the line had reached the bottom and remained taut under its own weight. Others delved into physics and proposed that if the total weight of the extended line exceeded its strength, it should have snapped by now, assuming it hadn't hit bottom. Ideas ranged from weighing the used line and dividing it by the weight of a single foot to using radar to determine the pit's actual depth. In a rather unconventional suggestion, one caller proposed throwing a live cat down the pit listening for any change in its cries as it descended. Art became uneasy with this proposal, so he offered his own idea, finding a volunteer to be lowered into the pit and report on what lay below. Despite concerns voiced by Mel about potential dangers deeper into the pit, such as high temperatures, extreme air pressures, and toxic gases, a caller eagerly volunteered for the job. However, Mel expressed reservations, and serious plans to carry out such a daring experiment were not entertained. Mel himself admitted hesitancy due to the risk of the rope breaking during the descent. Art posed a hypothetical scenario, questioning if Mel would be willing to jump down the pit if facing a terminal illness. Surprisingly, Mel affirmed his willingness. He went a step further and revealed that his will contained instructions for his body to be disposed of in the pit. Art, ever the provocateur, 
even floated the idea of allowing the government to dispose of radioactive waste into the pit for a fee, given its purported bottomless nature. During the broadcast, Mel disclosed a peculiar experiment. He claimed to have dropped more than one television vacuum tube into the pit, anticipating the sound of implosion. Art, expressing concern, warned him about potential trouble for polluting the groundwater with such objects. Mel, however, assured Art that despite years of waste disposal, the water in the surroundings remained perfectly pure. This bizarre episode provided a night of intriguing entertainment, but concluded immediately and left listeners with many questions. However, the story of Mel Waters and his infamous hole did not end there. Mel went to Ellensburg in search of someone who had purchased a matching belt buckle for him years earlier. To his surprise, he found an individual with such a buckle. While examining coins, Mel discovered a dime minted in 1943, a year when no dimes bore Roosevelt's face. Additionally, American coins typically bear a letter indicating the city of minting, and this dime had a perplexing B, although no U.S. city mint had ever begun with that letter. The buckle owner was baffled by the coin, so he sought advice from a coin dealer who couldn't explain it, but offered a substantial sum to purchase it. However, a few days later, the Treasury Department confiscated the coin from the man. The intriguing twist didn't end there. Richard C. Hoagland, a hyperdimensional physics theorist, suggested that the coins might originate from a parallel universe. Adding an element of mystery, Mel's former wife disappeared without a trace, leaving no clues as to her whereabouts. Meanwhile, Mel himself remained oblivious to the current state of his former property and who might be looking after it. Around the 16-minute mark in the 2002 audio file, skepticism began to infiltrate the minds of many. Mel's narrative seemed to be increasingly fantastical and unbelievable. However, just as skepticism was settling in, Mel dropped a bombshell on Art, marking one of the spookiest moments in radio history. He inquired if Art knew anything about the Terra server. The Terra server was an online repository of public domain aerial and satellite imagery, which came into existence in December 1997, eight months after Mel Waters first made his appearance on the radio. According to Mel, his nephew reported that his former property had been mysteriously obliterated or deleted from public domain imagery. The revelation sent shockwaves through the audience and made Mel's fantastic story suddenly seem less imaginary and more real-world mystery. Art Bell, in the aftermath of the commercial break, disclosed that listeners had quickly uncovered a satellite image of Mel's former property. Furthermore, Art testified to a TV camera crew visiting the Ellensburg area after an earlier interview with Mel. Their observations suggested evidence of military presence in the area, which reinforced the intrigue surrounding Mel's experiences. Mel introduced another piece of the puzzle. He claimed to have spoken with people at a truck stop near his former property who recounted witnessing a peculiar phenomenon. A black beam, reminiscent of anti-light, periodically shooting up into the sky from the area of the mysterious hole. One trucker friend mentioned delivering a significant quantity of fiber optic equipment to a warehouse in Ellensburg, specifically to a group of Israelis. Another trucker claimed to have transported large crated instruments from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in San Francisco, California, to the same warehouse. Notably, LLNL engages in projects for the U.S. military. The twist in Mel's story brought forward intriguing connections, with San Francisco being the city where Mel surfaced after his reported abduction. While Mel remained uncertain about any correlation, he felt it necessary to report the information. Amidst the revelations, a fan posed a compelling question to Art. What are the odds of a single person discovering two bottomless pits in a lifetime? While the odds seemed incalculably low, Mel countered with an unexpected twist. He claimed to have found a second one. This claim not only fascinated, but also added complexity to the already bewildering story. Coast to Coast AM was a highly popular radio program, particularly in the western half of the United States, which had a diverse audience with a strong interest in bizarre phenomena. This region, with abundant unused public land and Native American reservations, served as a hotbed for individuals fascinated by the unexplained. A group of Native Americans in Nevada, fascinated by Mel's accounts, 
reached out to him through email and invited him to their reservation. Their invitation aimed to explore Mel's expertise in arts and crafts and knowledge about wild plants. In early September 2001, Mel went to Nevada to meet this group of impoverished people who were intrigued by his research. These individuals were well-versed in plants and natural medicine and were captivated by Mel's accounts, especially his assertion that the plants he cultivated near the original hole exhibited extraordinary properties. Describing these unique plants to the group, Mel inquired if they were familiar with such varieties. In response, they led him to another hole situated in the middle of a village on public land, where Basque families, a small and isolated ethnic group originating from Europe, had settled. The Basques, primarily sheep farmers in Nevada since the 1800s, regarded this pit as a spiritual point. Interestingly, this pit also measured nine feet in width. It's adorned with a metal collar instead of a stone retaining wall. The metal lining extended into the depths, generating a peculiar field of warmth, distinct from conventional heat around it. Similar to Mel's hole, this newfound pit possessed intriguing sound-canceling properties. Directly above it, all sounds were nullified, creating an unusual silence. Striking the metal rim produced no sound. Animals, too, exhibited a fear toward this hole, and witnesses reported the presence of a black beam, reminiscent of the phenomenon observed around Mel's hole in Washington. Mel and the villagers decided to try experiments to understand the peculiarities of this hole further. Their initial experiment involved lowering a bucket of store-bought ice into the pit to a depth of 1,500 feet. Simultaneously, they kept another bucket of ice on the surface as a control, waiting for it to melt halfway. Upon retrieving the pit ice, they made a perplexing discovery. It had not melted. Strangely, the ice was lukewarm, and even more baffling, it remained solid when held in Mel's hands. In an attempt to test the ice's resilience, they decided to intensify their efforts by attempting to melt it over a fire pit. Instead of melting, the lukewarm ice caught fire. The flame it produced was heat-generating, though not a typical large yellow flame. Rather, it resembled a flickering light. Mel recounted that the bucket of ice continued to burn for months, persisting even as he shared the story on air. Strangely, one individual took some of this burning ice home and used it as a source of warmth for his cabin during the winter. Subsequent attempts to replicate the bucket experiment yielded mixed results, working only about one-third of the time. Despite the uncertainties, the intrigue persisted, driving Mel and the villagers to explore the boundaries of these unexplained occurrences further. One of the Basques, driven by curiosity, expressed a desire to be lowered into the hole. However, given the unpredictable outcomes of their experiments, particularly with the burning ice, they dissuaded him from attempting such a risky experiment. Instead, they decided to conduct a strange experiment, lowering a sheep into the pit. The initial stages of this experiment were terrifying, as the sheep resisted and refused to approach the hole. The persistent struggle of the sheep thwarted the initial attempts to execute the plan. Undeterred, the Basques took decisive action, stunning the sheep between the eyes and placing it in a crate with a cable attached for lowering. As they approached the hole, the sheep, now conscious, began to exhibit frenzied behavior, emitting blood-curling screams. However, as the crate was positioned directly over the pit, an eerie silence descended. The lamb, despite its violent shaking, became eerily quiet over the hole. The descent continued, and by the halfway point of the cable's length, any discernible movement ceased. At the pit's depth of 1,500 feet, Mel and the villagers sensed a peculiar vibration in the metal rim. Leaving the sheep below for half an hour, they commenced the ascent. However, as the crate reached the surface, it became apparent that something was amiss. The box was motionless. While the external appearance seemed unchanged, the sheep inside was lifeless. Despite its outward normalcy, a decision was made to dissect the sheep, and it revealed an internal state akin to being cooked. In the aftermath of the dissection of the sheep, a startling discovery unfolded. A villager observed a peculiar gel surrounding an enormous tumorous growth within the animal. Intrigued, and perhaps disturbed by this abnormality, they decided to investigate further. 
As they removed the tumor, an astonishing revelation awaited them. A fleshy creature, resembling an 18-inch long hybrid between a fetus and a seal, emerged. Its appearance bore a striking resemblance to a human, with the exception of its eyes. To their astonishment, the creature was not only alive, but connected to the tumor by an umbilical cord. The creature displayed an uncanny sentience and observed its surroundings with reverence, particularly focusing on Mel, as if recognizing him as its human father. In a moment that felt like a miracle, the creature disconnected itself from the umbilical cord. Despite suggestions to end its existence, the group decided against it. Instead, the creature crawled to the edge of the table, fixing its gaze on Mel. As the creature lay on the ground, a distinct smell of ozone emanated from it. Its posture and demeanor exuded a sense of intelligence and purpose. For two hours, the witnesses stood in awe, captivated by the creature's gaze, which Mel described as the most compassionate look he had ever witnessed. The creature seemed aware of its surroundings as it studied each of the humans present with a level of understanding that defied conventional explanation. As the encounter continued, the creature, with an unspoken invitation, made its way toward the hole. Mel felt a compelling sense of connection to the being and found himself compelled to assist it in reaching the top. In a moment of acknowledgement, the creature offered Mel a slow nod, turned around, and willingly plunged itself back into the mysterious hole. The witnesses were profoundly moved and emotionally drained by the inexplicable encounter as they stood in a state of silence. The events surrounding the emergence of the creature transcended the realm of scientific understanding and delved into the realms of the mystical and the unknown. Following the encounter with the creature, the villagers faced the decision to dispose of the remains of the sheep by returning them to the mysterious hole. Mel, grappling with an unexpected twist of fate, revealed that in late August, before his journey to Nevada, he had received a grim diagnosis of a lethal form of esophageal cancer, with a prognosis of six months to live. However, upon his return from Nevada, the cancer had vanished. Mel attributed this miraculous recovery to the creature and believed that it had somehow healed him during their time together in Nevada. A Basque elder, unfazed by the tale of the creature, handed Mel an object before bedtime and instructed him to put it away without looking at it. Mel, complying with the elder's directive, placed the object in his pocket. Upon later inspection, he retrieved something that the elder had found in the area, a 1943 Roosevelt dime. The appearance of this specific coin, linked to earlier events, deepened the sense of interconnectedness between Mel, the Basques, and the mystery surrounding the pits. In December of 2002, Mel Waters returned to Coast to Coast AM with a riveting update that added new dimensions to the story. Helicopters regularly flying over the village with the hole raised questions about the nature of the metallic collar around the new hole. Mel shared that this collar becomes invisible at a specific distance from the observer. Intriguingly, the mysterious 1943 dime, previously connected to the unexplained phenomena, also defied conventional visibility. At 15 feet away, it disappeared from view, leaving no trace on film or digital scanners. Mel further delved into the strange burning ice, recounting a Basque man's unusual experience. This individual had utilized a can of ever-burning ice as a heat source in his wood stove during the colder months. However, peculiar consequences unfolded. The man noticed persistent thirst, dry air, and increasingly dry skin within his home. Attempting to address the issue, he placed a kettle of water on a stove to humidify the air. Astonishingly, the steam from the stove seemed to linger around it and be absorbed by the stove itself. In a bizarre turn of events, the man returned home to discover that his stove had crashed through the hearth and floorboards of his cabin, sinking a foot into the ground below. Undeterred by the dangers of the frigid air, the cabin owner patched up his stovepipe and continued using the stove, now situated below his floor, to heat his home. However, a week or two later, he returned to find that his entire cabin had disintegrated into piles of dry wood dust. Faced with this inexplicable outcome, the man left the remnants behind and relocated to live with his brothers. A month later, the Basque man's bizarre encounter with the ever-sinking stove took an even more perplexing turn. 
Upon his return, he discovered that the stove had now descended five feet into the ground, leaving behind a glassy smooth surface. Troubled by the escalating strangeness of the situation, the man reached out to Mel Waters and shared the perplexing developments. Concerned about the implications, Mel decided to contact one of the mysterious officials who had been a point of contact during his time in Australia. The official, upon learning of the sinking stove, expressed deep concern and urgency, insisting that Mel provide detailed information about the cabin's location. Recognizing the intensity of the situation, Mel facilitated communication between the cabin owner and the officials. The officials decided to observe from hidden vantage points in the nearby hills. A specialized team, whose affiliation remained uncertain, whether military or scientific, was dispatched to deal with the sinking stove. Their arrival brought heavy-duty construction equipment, including cranes, as they grappled with the unusual challenge. Attempting to lift the stove proved difficult, even with the assistance of multiple cranes. Faced with this unexpected obstacle, the team resorted to a peculiar solution. They dropped chains into the ground and poured water over them. This unconventional approach somehow facilitated the hoisting of the stove, and with the combined efforts of multiple cranes, they succeeded in extracting it from the ground. To add to the intrigue, the stove was then loaded onto what the cabin owner described as the largest truck he had ever seen. The mysterious team immediately hauled the stove away and left behind numerous questions and an air of secrecy that hung over the entire operation. The bizarre nature of the event triggered associations in Mel's mind, drawing parallels to the fictional substance Ice-9 described in Kurt Vonnegut's book Cat's Cradle. Ice-9 is a theoretical form of a water molecule that had the peculiar property of freezing at a high temperature and converting surrounding water into the same form. Vonnegut's concept, inspired by a scientist he had worked with, postulated a substance with the potential to freeze all the water on Earth and transform people into statues. While the sinking stove bore no direct resemblance to Ice-9, the connection resonated with the mysterious and otherworldly events surrounding the pits. Following the perplexing events surrounding Mel's hole, an air of uncertainty and paranoia settled over Mel Waters. He became convinced that he was being trailed as he recounted instances where individuals he intended to converse with managed to locate him despite his efforts to remain elusive. This realization prompted Mel to make a decisive choice. He opted not to revisit the mysterious hole as he feared that his connection could lead someone else to its location. Meanwhile, the Basques, the indigenous people who shared in the encounters with Mel, conveyed an intriguing development. They informed Mel that the mysterious creature, which had emerged from the deceased sheep and returned to the hole, made recurrent visits. According to the Basques, they had established a form of communication with this creature. Remarkably, the method of communication employed by the creature took an unconventional form. It spoke through one of their boom boxes. Attempting to document this dialogue, the Basques recorded the exchanges, only to encounter an unexpected outcome. Instead of capturing discernible dialogue, the tape yielded a series of erratic and pulsating tones that defied interpretation. In light of these anomalous interactions, Mel proposed the creature's identity as a potential rock flyer. In Native American lore, rock flyers are legendary beings residing beneath the earth, possessing the ability to traverse between multiple earths. The creature, it seemed, had shared a forewarning with the Basques concerning the burning ice. According to the creature, the misuse of the ice cannon had the potential to unleash destruction upon the earth. It cautioned against careless and avaricious handling of the ice, and predicted that such misuse could have catastrophic consequences for the planet. Delving deeper into the creature's revelations, it conveyed a perspective on the broader cosmic landscape. The creature asserted that intelligent beings on other worlds anticipated humanity's self-destructive path through nuclear warfare. Once the human race had rendered itself extinct, these beings planned to intervene and harness the power of the burning ice on Earth. A chilling realization emerged from the creature's discourse. Whenever the burning ice was discovered in the universe, it was almost invariably subjected to improper use. This recurring pattern, as described by the creature, painted a bleak picture of the potential consequences associated with the unearthing of such mysterious forces. The interview concluded with these mysterious revelations, and since that moment, 
Mel Waters vanished from public awareness. The once active participant in uncovering the mysteries of Mel's hole withdrew from the public eye and left a void of information and countless unanswered questions. So what are your thoughts on Mel's hole? Let us know in the comments section below. We will be back to you with another amazing video. Until then, goodbye.